God is faithful to hear his children. Victories will come our way. He cannot send them until we ask him. Somebody needs to pray. Somebody go get God. Somebody go get God. Tell him. Somebody go get God. We have a promise from Holy Scripture, one that makes God's children brave. That if we seek Him, we can find Him. We can move His hand today. Somebody go. burdens. Somebody go get God. Somebody go get God. Tell him with thirsty. Beg him for mercy. Will somebody go Greetings, a quick update from Africa. This is Akim. You know, a few things I just want to let you know about what is happening right now. Uh, today is Sunday, the 10th, and to you over there, it is good morning. Thank you so much for your prayers, and thank you so much for your support of this work this side. I just want to explain a few things to you so that you know how to pray for us. Uh, the situation is not what we are used of. It is different because every day we are waking up with a challenge. New cases are coming up, more death. And yesterday it was announced that seven people died. Because, you know, the testing, it is not done everywhere countrywide. It is just on the selected part. No wonder we don't know who is sick, who has it, and this is how far it is spreading. So please pray for us so that God will intervene in this situation. Yesterday, uh, we had a, a privilege of you know, visiting our people in the bush just to encourage them and also to help them stay faithful, to help them, you know, keep on praying so that God will intervene in this situation. Now, to my surprise, is what I did find out there. You know, people are suffering. People have no food. And the people are going through a big challenge. And it is only God who is able to do what he can do. Because his power is beyond description. We pray that you people can pray for our situation as we are also praying for you. Uh, the situation we are facing right now in Zambia is what I have never seen before. Very soon we'll see people dying 
especially in our community because people don't even know what this virus is and how you can prevent it you know is washing not touching your mouth and you have to make sure you sanitize your hands and that is very difficult in the bush because people depend on you know taking stuff so they are producing down you sell and come back buy soap from town so that you can use but that is difficult so please pray for us so that god will help and also god will intervene uh, uh, I'll take this opportunity to thank you people who are supporting this work. Uh, many churches in states, uh, they are supporting and also praying for us. Uh, thank you so much for that. And those people, uh, definitely it will be hard for me to mention each, 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 each by name, but thank you so much for your prayers and thank you so much for your tireless effort in making sure that you people, you are on our prayers and that we are on your prayers. We appreciate that so much. Keep on praying for us and I'll update you more and more with the situation in Zambia. But as of now today, you know, we are very much shocked how the number is jumping. Uh, like from 100, it is now 200, now it is 250, we don't know. Because yesterday, seven people died. So please, please keep on praying for us. And as we are also visiting our people, pray so that God can give us safety as we are encouraging the people, trying to educate them how they should, you know, keep themselves with that social distance and, you know, trying to help with masking up their face and also try to educate them how to wash their hands regularly. Those are the things that we are helping our community to do. Thank you so much and keep on praying for us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I hope you're having a wonderful Lord's Day. I hope you already took some time and spent time in the Word of God and in prayer. And I hope that since there's no special music or congregational singing here, that you're singing some songs at home. That would be really cool. Uh, singing together as a family, praying for each and every one of you. And, of course, we miss you here. We're in Acts this morning, Acts chapter number 20, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. And as you're turning to those scriptures, I just have a few announcements for us. Uh, I want to keep on watching here on our YouTube channel. Make sure that you like these videos. Make sure that you share them with your friends, with your family. What we're working on doing, too, is just uh, splicing them so that it just starts at the sermon. You can share the sermon. Also, the sermons will be titled there. And uh, so share them. Like them. Subscribe to the channel. Then also visit our website, lbbc.info. Am I right, Elizabeth? All right. She told me I'm correct. So make sure you go to the website. Of course, you can give on there. You can give, uh, you can designate to missionaries and things along that nature. We've been having a lot of online giving. We praise the Lord for that. The Lord has been taking care of our church through the pandemic financially. We praise the Lord for you. For that, thank you for your faithfulness to God's house. Make sure you get plugged in with a small group and uh, contact the church and we will get you with the small group leader. Ladies, on uh, Friday at 10 o'clock, I have a ladies' Bible study and prayer meeting. You can be a part of that. Talk to Betsy Major about that. Then also, take your smart device, take your smartphone, and program it every day at noon that you would pray for this pandemic. Pray for our country, those in leadership. Pray for our church, our church family, and pray for God just to use this. And that uh, the Lord would send our country a third great awakening and that we could be a part of that. And it's going to be a labor of prayer. And we really need to fight the devil in the avenue of praying. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So pray, pray, pray. Set those, set those uh, alarms on your phones. It's just great every day, even at 12 o'clock blows through and you miss it you're not near your phone you'll get that little push notification on your phone pray mike says pray for corona and so i'm praying for it every day and uh so set your phones to that x chapter number 20 and i'm going to read from verse 17 and i am going to read down to verse number 24 
Acts 20 and verse number 17, it says this, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. When they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came unto Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the laying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of of God. You're preaching a message entitled, None of These Things Move Me. And let's pray and we'll jump into the message. God, you are so good. We thank you just for the blessings that we receive day after day. Great are thy mercies every day and great is thy faithfulness. And Lord, we thank you that we serve a faithful God. We thank you that you are in control. We thank you that uh, we don't know the future, but you do. And Lord, we thank you that our times are in your hand. Lord, I pray that you would bless the church, bless the congregation this morning as uh, they're watching here on the screen. Bless them. Help them just to be able to focus and concentrate, uh, concentrate on your word today. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Here the Apostle Paul is stopping by Ephesus and he sees the leaders that he knows and loves in the Lord. These people that he had led to Christ, this church plant, this, this uh, child of his uh, that, uh, that he established there. That these people were born in the kingdom of God by, uh, by the Holy Spirit of God, but then also by the Apostle Paul's just uh, blood, sweat, and toil, and tears here. And he loves these people very dearly, and they love him very dearly. And at the end of this account, as Paul is getting back on the vessel, and he's going to sail to Jerusalem, and he knows he's been told by the Holy Spirit that things are going to befall him in Jerusalem. They're at the end of the docks and they weep together. These people who are bound together on earth and they weep because they will see his face no more. The closest relationship to someone that you can have here on this earth is a spiritual relationship. A spiritual relationship. These people were born again into the kingdom of God. They're born again into the family of God. And because they had come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel that Paul says he preached, the gospel of the grace of God, he preached to them the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he preached to them how Christ lived a perfect life, that he died a perfect sacrifice for sins, and that these people were hell-bound sinners and they needed the Savior. And the Lord Jesus Christ loved them. He was mighty to save. And that if they would call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, that he, the Lord Jesus, would save them from their sins and give them a home in heaven. They were wonderfully, miraculously saved. And they were born again in the family of God. And they grew close not only to God, but they also grew close to the Apostle Paul, whom they loved the Lord in and whom they served the Lord together with. So here's the last charge. If you will, this is a deathbed charge. And uh, great preachers in the past have said that you preach... As a dying man, man to dying men. And here he preaches to them. He knows he will not be able to preach another message to them. That this is the last time he's going to see them. And so the words that he says are very, very, very important. And here we have uh, in our hands a record of this account. He says in verse number 18, You have been with me in all seasons. Paul writes to young Timothy and he says, Be instant in season. And 
out of season. And he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sometimes the gospel is going to be in season. I think in the 1970s, you know, I, I only lived for two years in the 1970s, but I heard about all the souls that were saved in the 1970s. And there's uh, somewhat of a revival in the 1970s. And probably you and your family or you yourself uh, were, were somehow influenced by someone who was saved in the 1970s. The gospel was in season at that time. And I believe we live in a day and age now that not for all, but for many, that the gospel is out of season and that uh, the church is deemed irrelevant. And the church at this moment is unnecessary and the church at this moment is not going to meet, uh, you know, by government mandate and because it is obsolete, it is unnecessary and as we are, called, we are told that um, it is out of season. It's out of place. So here I've been with you in all seasons. He says, I've been with you in good times and I've been with you in bad. For better and for worse. Uh, what they say is, uh, you know, when a pastor takes a church, especially when he comes from without and he's not hired from within, that it takes seven years to become someone's pastor. The reason why you have to experience the ups and the downs of life together with the church family before they fully adopt you. They might respect you because of your position of authority or, or the title of your office. There might be some respect and there should be some respect for the office of pastor. But you don't come into the fullness of the relationship until seven years goes by. Well, Paul says to this, I am fully yours and you are fully mine. We have been together and we've weathered the storm, both in the good times and also in the bad times. And again, in the Bible, when it says in season and out of season, in particular, we see the use of this. It has to do with uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so sometimes the gospel and church is going to be in season and then sometimes it is going to be uh, irrelevant and unnecessary in the world's eyes. He's been with them through everything. And then he says also that he's taught them publicly and from house to house. He says in verse number 19, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying of weight of the Jews. So Paul says, none of these things move me. So one of the things that is not going to move him here is that uh, things is going to happen to him in the future. It says in verse number 23, it says, save the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying the bonds and afflictions abide in me. He says, uh, in particular, when I go to Jerusalem, I know that there's going to be future dangers there. And then also in verse number 19, he suffered physical Sufferings. Bob Jones Sr. used to say this. Moving parts create friction. And so things that are dead, and then also churches that are dead, they don't create any friction. Uh, remember, the church in Laodicea, they had, they had a name that they lived, but yet they were dead. Uh, they were lukewarm. Uh, you know what? After you die, you assume room temperature. There's a lot of churches in society. They might have many, many, many numbers. They might have big crowds and masses there. And, and they, there is a whole multitude. And they might be going on the broad way, a bunch of them together. Uh, but they're lukewarm. They are dead. They have assumed room temperature, meaning there's no difference between the group of people there and the people outside of the world, outside in the world. And so they are dead. You know what the Bible says? Uh, 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 that uh, Paul says, well, it says, none of these things move me. So he says, future dangers, they don't move me. Then also he says, physical dangers and physical sufferings, they don't move me either. So in verse 19 again, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. If you look in 2 Corinthians in chapter number 11, 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Paul talks about some of the physical suffering that he had to endure. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24. Actually, verse number 23, I'm going to read there. 
Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in laborers more abundantly in stripes above measure in prisons more frequent in deaths oft of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes save one thrice was I beaten with rods once was I stoned thrice I suffered shipwreck a night and a day I have been in the deep in journeyings often in perils of waters and perils of robbers and perils of mine own countrymen and perils of the heathen and perils in the city and perils in the wilderness and perils in the sea and perils among many false brethren in weariness in painfulness in watchings often in hunger and thirst in fastings often in cold and nakedness besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily the care of the churches he says there's physical suffering and there's a a long lengthy list of about 15 things that paul had to experience physically and then i I love being a pastor i love verse number 29 and if you care for the spiritual well-being of a group or a family a particular uh issue uh that's going on we see in verse number 29 i'm sorry verse 28 it says, beside those things that are without, meaning physical things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches. It says, these things will not move me. These future dangers, these physical sufferings, and then also these things, are these things of rejection. Paul suffered and suffered and suffered the rejection of those that are Without and The Bible says that the fear of man causeth the snare. And you should, ought to never get involved in gospel ministry if you're not prepared to be rejected by fellow man. Paul says this about Demas in 2 Timothy 4.10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Demas was a promising young man. You know, Paul writes, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Demas would have been a young man that you'd found in Sunday school, Sunday morning service, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You would have gone to soul winning, uh, that he would have been on fire for the Lord. And Paul would never have invested in somebody unless they were promising young man. And so he took Demas underneath his wing. And it wasn't like they just went, uh, went somewhere for an hour or two on a preaching venture. No, Demas was underneath Paul's wing, and they traveled together to churches, two places, and they shared the word of God, and they shared life together. Demas was Paul's son in the faith. He was, just, he was like a child to him. Paul was pouring his own life into this young man, and it says, Demas hath forsaken me. Remember that the Lord was despised and rejected by all Men, uh, fellow preachers would also reject Paul. Second Timothy one fifteen, this thou knowest that all they which are in Asia, be turned away from me. Second Timothy four sixteen, he says, at my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Now, knowing just a little bit about those that are, that are in the ministry and those who have a purpose uh, and, and those, who, those who live their lives to be a blessing to others, the biggest, the biggest form of suffering would be upon this earth. wouldn't be anything that would be physical. The biggest form of suffering here upon this earth would be when someone that you love and you've invested your life in has turned away from you and has turned away from you from the Lord. So none of these things move me. The these things of rejection. Also the these things of being persecuted by the people that he loved the most, the people that he was burdened for the most, and that would have been his own nation, the children of Israel. Paul loved the Jews, and in Romans 10, 1, he tells his heart's desire. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Romans 9, 1 through 3, he says this. Here is 
another heart's desire in prayer. He says in Romans 9, 1, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Here is the here is Paul's heart's desire is that his brethren, the Jews, would be saved. Well, what happened was the Jews and the Judaizers, what we call the Judaizers, these legalists, they followed Paul from town to town and persecuted him from town to town. And he, in his last journey, was going to go back to Jerusalem and one last attempt and one last try, try to win his dear brethren to Christ. And they would, they would there want to pull him to pieces. And if it wasn't for the Roman government protecting him and sending him off to Rome, he would have been killed by his own people. He is rejected by those that he loves. And in Romans chapter number nine, he says this along with Moses. Because remember that God was going to write, wipe Israel off the face of the map. And that uh, he was going to raise up unto Moses seed unto himself. He was going to start over with Moses. And Moses said, he said, if you can't forgive them, then blot my name out of your book. And here's Paul saying, if it were possible, I would wish myself accursed that Israel might be saved. He cared even more about their salvation than he did about his very own. And so he was persecuted by his brethren. And these things will not move me. These things of disease. Paul was a man who physically suffered, uh, was physically persecuted, but then also he had his thorn in the flesh. He had a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And he writes about that at length in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Uh, we can only speculate what his thorn in the flesh was. Uh, most scholars would believe that he had some sort of an eye disease, what we would call an oriental eye disease, that his eyes would continually water. It talks about the wiping of his eyes. As he writes to the Galatian church, he says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you. What are you saying there? You see how large the letters are. So most likely this great scholar, this great man of the faith, had to, in close page, in order to be legible to himself, he had to write large letters to that Galatian church. And then, the, then he says about the Galatian church that they loved him, and if it were possible, they would have plucked out their own eyes. He must have had some sort of a continuing battle with some sort of physical malady to his eyes. But these things would not move him. Then he also, like us all, we can identify with this. He had the, these things of personal failure. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall save me from the body of this death? He says in, in Romans chapter number seven, the things that I would do, I do not. And the things that I wouldn't do, that's the thing that I do. He was a wretched man. He calls himself the chief of sinners. All, among sinners, he said, I am the top of the list. And I've met a lot of former this and a former that. And uh, I say many times, uh, we have a church full of used tos. She used to do this. He used to do that. They used to go there. They used to go over here. And there's always a bunch of used to's in a church. There's always a lot of people with a background. There's always a lot of people with a history that have come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise the Lord for the redeeming grace of Jesus that reaches way down in a pit and saves us, sets our feet upon a rock and establishes our going. But I've never met a person yet that has killed Christians before they got saved. I mean, their entire mission in life was to go in and arrest Christians. I, I never met a, a man who uh, held another's coats while they stoned a Christian to death. But this was the Apostle Paul. He had personal failures and personal failings. He was the chief of sinners, and he said, I am the least of all saints. So that these things of personal failures would not stop him. Then I think of the things that we face as well. We face future dangers. Jesus said, take no thought on the morrow. 
uh, for the morrow shall take thought on the things of itself. Sufficient on the morrow is the evil thereof. You and I, we're going to face evil things in the future. We have future dangers. We have physical sufferings. And uh, right now in our country, we know that um, there's a political maneuver to, to persecute Christians and to say that we're irrelevant and that we are unnecessary and uh, that we uh, do, do not play an important role in society. There's physical suffering. There's rejection. The Bible says that at the end times there will be a great falling away and that many, many, the faith of many and the hearts of many, that they will wax cold. They're going to assume and assimilate that room temperature. We know that there's disease, that there's suffering, and we know this, along with Paul, that these things we will face, will face personal failure. But Paul says this, he makes this declaration in Acts 20, 24, but none of these things shall move me. I have quick three points on none, none of these things will move me. Paul says this, he says, my life, I count it not dear. He says, my course, I'm going to finish with joy. And he says, the ministry that I have received of the Lord, I am going to fulfill my life my race, and my ministry. Number one, my life. Paul said, I counted not my life dear unto myself. The Bible tells us what kind of life that the apostle Paul led before he was saved. And here was Paul's life described in Philippians chapter number three. Philippians three and verse number five, he says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But none of these things were gain to me. Those I counted loss for Christ. I, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul tells us there, he says, I was a Roman citizen. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, that I was not only a Pharisee of the most powerful sect in my nation, but I was above all other Pharisees. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was a ruler of the Jews. I was a member of the ruling Sanhedrin. I was one of the 70 that made decisions how the nation of Israel ought to go. I was a student, he says, of Gamaliel. As far as education and as far as status and as far as rank in society, which would also equal wealth. He says, I was at the top of the top. He says, but none of those things that I count, but anything. He says there that I counted these things, that rank in society, but dung, that I might win Christ. So here's what happened to Paul, is that he weighed his life. My life I counted not dear. He says, he says, here is the Pharisee of the Pharisees, the ruler of the Jews. He says, on rank and status and society, this ruling class. I was at the top of the top. And he says, this thing I counted but dung that I might win Christ. It was the same thing with Moses. And Moses, he said, it says in uh, Hebrews chapter number 11, that Moses, when he has come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing the reproaches of Christ, greater riches. So here's Christ on one end of the scale, one end of the spectrum. And here's my life on the other end of the spectrum. And he says, Christ is so much better. He says that I look at my old life as dung. My life I counted not dear unto myself. And the reason why I counted not dear is because Christ was so much better. It says in Colossians 3, 4. So he says what he did with his life was he counted Christ better. Colossians 3, 4. And it says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Paul says this in Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
Remember that Christ said, I came to give life and life more abundantly. That means that if you do not have the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, the quality of your own life is so poor that the Lord Jesus Christ counts it as death. The life without Christ is purposeless. It is pointless. It's an act in futility. And then ultimately, without Christ, we end up for an eternity without Christ. Eternal death. Paul says, my own life, I don't count that dear. I hold on to Christ's life. And now Christ is my life. That is what counts. And number C, underneath my life, is what he became. Paul let the Lord determine what he was to become. When we try to hold on to my life, we try to write our own life story. We try to build a life. We try to make an identity for ourselves. Whether, you know, it's an identity of a businessman whether it's an identity of an entrepreneur or whether it's an identity of a fantastic supermom or some sort of uh, executive or a cowboy or a mountain man or this or that. Everyone's trying to build a life, trying to build an ego. Paul says, I don't identify my life as an entity of itself. I, my life's identity It's wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is at the center of my life, and everything that happens in my life is identified by him. He says, my life I counted not dear. Secondly, he talks about my course. He says, my course, he says that I'm going to finish my course. I'm going to finish my course with joy. And he does. And we're going to look at that here in a minute. But Ephesians 2.10 says this, it says this, you are running your own race. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before hath ordained that we should walk in them. We're God's workmanship, and God has ordained good works that we should walk in them. Jeremiah 1.5 says this, Before I formed thee, in the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So it says in Ephesians 2.10 that you are ordained. Because you're saved, we know that we are ordained by God and we're ordained unto something. We're ordained unto good works. Now, Jeremiah, God said, Jeremiah, I knew you before you were formed in the womb. We know that life starts at conception, and we know that God knows us from eternity past, and we are eternal souls, and God knew us not when we were born. God knew us before we were born, and God says that, Jeremiah, you were ordained for a purpose. I had a God, I had a, a, a God's will was laid out for Jeremiah before he was even born. Paul says this about his own life in Galatians 1.5. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Paul said, God had a plan for my life before I was even formed in my mother's womb. You and I are ordained unto good works. We have our own path. We have our own shoes to fill. I can't fill your shoes and you can't fill my shoes, but by the grace of God, I can walk in the steps and in the path and in the course that God has called me to. Paul was going to finish. You're running your race. Paul was going to finish with joy. And, uh, you know, some people, what happens in their life is they enter into the wrong race and they run the wrong race and they lose. And there's no joy. Uh, there's, you can run the wrong race, and, and you can, um, as Paul said, you can fight the good fight of faith, or you can run the wrong race, and you can fight the wrong fight. General Patton said this. Uh, he said, don't fight a fight simply because you can 
win. Now, if I can get in an argument and fight with my wife um, because I can win, I might lose, I might win the battle, but I might lose the war. And uh, I'm not going to enter into a fight unless I can win. And God says, I have given you a good fight of faith. And life is a struggle. We are born struggling. We preached about Jacob a few weeks ago. And Jacob was born wrestling. And you and I, we are born in this life. And this life is a race. And this life is a struggle. This life is a fight. But we have to beware unless we run the wrong race. Not the race that God intended for us to win. Uh, that we fight the wrong fight. But Paul says, I have run the right race and I am going to finish my course with joy. Second Timothy chapter number four and verse number seven. Here's Paul's signing off from this world. This is the last letter he writes. He's writing to his preacher by Timothy from a Mamertine prison. And he knows that he is going to die for the faith. And he is writing this letter with joy. Hear the joy in his voice as he's, his ship is about to set sail. Second Timothy chapter number four in verse number six, it says this, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that do love his appearing. Paul says this about his course there in verse number seven. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And all you can run in this life is just your own course. I like the phrase where it says, and David served his generation. God knew you from before you were formed in your mother's womb. God picked out your parents. God picked out your circumstances. God picked out your situation. God picked out the time frame in which you were born. God knew that you would be alive here upon his earth at 20 in the year 2020. And God has equipped you for the time, the place, and given you the talents, given you the personality, and, and given you everything that you need to run by the Holy Spirit your own race. Paul ran his race. He finished his race. His race is done. But your race and my race is not done. That should be exciting. That should be, uh, that, sh that, that should motivate you that you have a course set before you and only you can run it. You are God ordained to, Paul calls it, his ministry. Last thing he talks about is my ministry, his ministry of the gospel. So he says there in Acts 20 and verse number 24, but none of these things move me. So, so he sees it. Uh, physical suffering couldn't move him. Future dangers couldn't move him. Rejection of his brethren couldn't move him. All these things could not move him. He says, here's the reason why. I counted not my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul stuck to the point. And the point is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you and I are to be bearers of the good news, that we are to spread the good news of the gospel of Christ Jesus. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ should be in every message that we share, every message that we preach, that we don't preach a self-help, self-righteous gospel, that we preach the cross of Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Salvation comes through the power of the cross. The, the power to live the Christian life comes through the message of the gospel through the Lord Jesus Christ by him, by what he has done for us, that we preach Christ and we preach him 
crucified. I think of Romans chapter number one and verse number eight, where Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. That Paul was going to preach it. He was going to preach it to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, you and I. He was going to preach it to the Jewish people, his own brethren. And he was going to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's your ministry. And that's my ministry. So you can sit your grandkids up on your knee and you can teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can tell your neighbor about the Lord Jesus Christ. We had three guys out, construction guys in the parking lot yesterday. And I went out there and I handed them the Corona track. And, uh, and I said, hey, I wrote this. I'm not seeing very many people nowadays because of this uh, the pandemic, but I wrote this. I want you to read it. And I'm just supposed to, and you're just supposed to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to live out the gospel. We're to preach the gospel and spread the gospel everywhere we go. Paul kept back. He says here in verse number 20, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I taught you publicly and from house to house. That's Acts 2020. That's our theme verse for this year as a church. Acts 2020. I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I taught you publicly and from house to house. I never dreamed that we had such a house to house ministry via live stream. Uh, and, but let me encourage you too, that Paul says in publicly and from house to house. Churches are not just a content creator to create content to spread out on the YouTubes. That churches assemble publicly and they have under every tyrant, under every regime and under every, every type of tyrannical government and people, they have come together and the church is a church as they assemble. You are the body and you are members in particular. The church building is not the church. The people are the church and the people are the church as they are called out and they come together. He says, I've taught you publicly and I've taught you from house to house. I've kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. You know what's profitable to those, those uh, people there in Ephesus? The message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, none of these things move me. My life I counted not dear unto myself. He says, I'm going to finish my course with joy. God doesn't promise us tomorrow. He didn't promise me three score and ten years. I might live that long. If by strength, I might live to four score years. No matter where you're at at the spectrum, you should be excited about finishing your course with joy. And then lastly, he says there about his ministry, he says, in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Praise the Lord for the gospel of the grace of God. And let's pray. Tune in tonight. We finished up Titus. And, and Titus says right in chapter number three that uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy, he has saved us. Then he goes on and challenges the church that they were to continue in good works. He says, you're not saved by good works, but God's people are to be a people of good works. You know how they perform their good works? By the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray and we'll be done. Lord, thank you for the word of God. I, I thank you for Acts chapter number 20 and just a blessing that chapter has been in my own life. And Lord, we thank you for the challenging words, the final words by the great apostle to the flock there in Ephesus. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to say, along with the apostle Paul, none of these things move me. Help us to not be moved. Help our life to not be counted precious, not dear to ourselves, but we would embrace Christ's life instead. Lord, help us to run our course, the course that you have set before us, the perfect will of God. And Lord, I pray that also that you would help us just to perpetuate the ministry of the gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. Hope to see you soon.